All right, I think let's begin. Uh, first of all, I think good morning, everyone. Thank you for making your way to this uh, tutorial. So my name is Hadi. So I'm uh, the last guy there. Uh, I myself, uh, I'm from Singapore Management University. And uh, today, I think we're going to talk about this particular tutorial. And this is, of course, joint work uh, with a few colleagues um, from Yale. Uh, there is Delvin, uh, Meng Lin, and Rex. And, but today, only I can be here on site uh, because some of them have uh, issues with travel as well. Uh, but I'm accompanied uh, by Delvin. So maybe he's now online. So maybe I will invite him to just say a few words to welcome you. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Delvin. Uh, I'm a postdoc at Yale University. Yeah, so welcome to our tutorial. I uh, hope you will enjoy the tutorial and learn something useful. Right. Okay, so uh, they're going to be more or less four parts to the tutorial. Uh, we are going to do this in an interleaving manner. Like I'm going to do part one, Delvin is going to do part two, and I'm going to do part three, he's going to do part four. Uh, but I think throughout, we can handle questions together uh, because I think we also have a history of working together. I think so we should be able to manage this uh, as well. And, and please make it more interactive. I think this is not a very large group. So I think we welcome questions at any time. If you want us to clarify something or to get more into some topic, or you, or you want to contribute your own thoughts and opinions about certain things, I think we do find that interesting because I think we, we are still interested in this space as well. Now, the topic that we're going to cover today is what we call uh, graph representation learning. But I think the keyword there is the text attributed. So in this particular sense, uh, of course, there's been a lot of attention on graphs, but people are just looking at the structure of the graph. In those are the connections and the connectivity of the nodes and the vertices. Uh, I think the point of view that we uh, put across here is the idea that uh, this graph are usually not just structural, uh, but it has semantic meaning. And this semantic meaning are often embedded within the vertices in terms of text. And text is a special kind of data. I mean, it's not just simply like structured attributes like in a database. Uh, text is a lot more... Um, ambiguous, sequential, at the same time, it's unstructured. So I think there is a lot of uh, interplay between the textual part and the graph part that, uh, that come together in terms of uh, 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 developing this idea of representation learning. Now, the representation learning part, in the end, we try to come to a representation for every node in the vertex, uh, every vertex in the graph, which is also a document. Now, the second part of the subtitle is basically saying uh, methods, application, and challenges. We do try to cover different methods. Uh, part of it is going to be related to um, things like uh, pre, uh, language, uh, language model transformers and so on. Part of it is related to graph neural networks, and part of it is related to the notion of uh, topic modeling. Now, topic modeling is something that uh, had been popular uh, in the past, uh, but I think we see that it still maintains some relevance in terms of uh, its interpretability, and the ability for us to essentially get a sense of some lower dimensional representation of a document, but at the same time, having some uh, interpretation uh, of its meaning through words and so on. Okay, so, uh, so the first part here is really opening. I think we're going to take you first into a gentle introduction to some of the underlying methods, uh, things that, uh, what are some of the basic things that people do with graphs, what is the basic thing people do with text, and then, and then we motivate how we can bring them together in a seamless manner. Now, why are we interested in text? Of course, you know, uh, there are a lot of data that are essentially text. Uh, we write papers, so we, we exactly know what text is all about, how rich in meaning it is. But of course, you know, there are things like product descriptions. Uh, if you go and try to select which product to buy, uh, which product to uh, select, which movie to watch, and so on, you probably see some synopsis, some description. And every day, they are news. Uh, it's a nonstop uh, stream of text that basically get generated uh, every day. Now, beyond that text structure, uh, we don't actually think of things, even in documents, as standalone documents. Uh, just like when we get papers, uh, we don't read the paper by itself. Most of the time, we get one paper. It's difficult to understand it in, in its entirety. We need to see other papers that are related to this. So in that sense, you see papers are citing one another. So, so in, in the citation structure, in the way that they are interlinked to one another, uh, we can understand more meaning than what we can glean just from a single document. 
And I think that is the underlying intuition as to why we believe that uh, there is a lot of importance in terms of uh, uh, this sense of graph structure that link documents together. So you can think of it almost in two different directions. You can think of this notion of text attributed graph as documents that get linked to one another. You can also think of it in terms of having a graph where every vertex has a textual description. Uh, both perspectives, I think, are valid. And I think uh, that's essentially what we are going to look at as well. Okay, so some very basic notation, the corpus of documents, we just call it, call it D, and that's going to be consistent. And the graph structure is going to be called epsilon, uh, which is kind of like E, just write it in a nicer way. <laughs> okay, so uh, how would you process text attributed graph? And I think here we would first come from the graph point of view. Uh, and I think a lot of you are probably working on graph neural networks or graph related models and so on. So that is the current way in which we uh, pretty much look at graph. Of course, that's not the only way. In the past, people look at different methods, like let's say spectral methods. Uh, they may use some form of factorization to look at the uh, structure in the graph. They may be looking at like, partitioning to discover clusters in the graph. But I think the modern way in terms of what we considering today, a lot of it comes down to some of graph neural networks, because what we try to do then is to try to extract what are some of the underlying uh, features or representations we get from the graph that will make it useful for some further downstream applications. So when we use graph neural networks, then of course, it's going to be good at capturing the graph itself, how the nodes are interconnected, the structure, uh, but they wouldn't model the text part. So for example, two nodes may be connected, but they may have different textual content. So in the sense that, for example, you may, you may write a paper, there's another paper that may not actually be deeply related to one another. So in that, in that sense, it's not sufficient just to look at the link, right? Uh, we need to look at the content. On the other hand, there are also other cases where there are very related papers that are not cited. So meaning that there are some connections in the semantic space that may not manifest in the actual links. So I think that, that in that sense, it's not enough just to look at the graph structure. Now, the other space, of course, is to look at the text. Now, what do you do with text? There are many things you can do with text, but when you talk to people today, <laughs> they will think directly to pre-trained language models. And indeed, this is the current space that is very active. Uh, but of course, you know, the flip side of the language models is that they don't capture the graph structure. So they think of every text actual sentence, paragraph, and so on, as essentially being standalone, as opposed to uh, having this notion of connectivity. Now, then we hark back to the notion of topic models. So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the notion of topic models. Uh, a long time ago, I think it was made popular with, by things like LDA. So it was uh, originally um, popularized by the st statistical community when they tried to model this in terms of uh, graphical models and trying to learn latent variables that will more likely to appear in some documents as opposed to other documents. And the thinking is that these are corresponding to the context of topics. Topic here can be broadly understood as uh, some coherent uh, clustering of words that will uh, allow us to, uh, to, uh, to understand the, the notion of uh, uh, what the meaning that, that may exist within the words. Now, today, of course, we talk about generative AI, generative models, and so on. And the idea is that you go to ChatGPT, and the ChatGPT will just spit out the text and so on, right? Uh, but a long time ago, the notion of generative model uh, actually comes in the statistical sense as to how do we generate a realistic distribution of words. And so what is the underlying uh, statistical model that will allow you to generate a uh, realistic distributions of words. So, so in that sense, a lot of topic models were statistically motivated, but you know, with the advent of neural networks, and of course, some of the later models would actually look at uh, uh, the, the use of other uh, uh, dimensionality reduction methods like autoencoders and so on to model topics as well. But again, I think they are not modeling uh, the graph structure either. So essentially what we are trying to approach here is the, is the thinking is that how do we mesh the two together, the notion of text, the notion of graph, and we try to do so in as seamless a manner as possible. I think the objective here is to do a survey of some of the existing work 
as well as to introduce you to multiple perspectives. I think because sometimes we come from a single perspective of looking at the problems. Maybe you've been working a lot with transformers. Maybe you've been working a lot with GNNs. You may not have discovered topic models or the other way around. So what we hope to do is to try and introduce you to, to both sides of the space so that you get a better idea, you know, possibly even for things that you might want to approach in some future research work. So tax attribute graph, in a very simplistic way, documents plus graph, right? But of course, they are not two separate things. They are one thing because the nodes in the graph are actually the text documents and the node in the graph are essentially described by the text as well. So then we look at uh, the notion of how do we mesh the graphs and the text together. So I think one way is that the base could be JNN, but JNN of course itself is a generic way of describing things. I mean, in a sense that there could be different variety of JNNs as well. And we're gonna discuss uh, in some ways how JNN is gonna work together with LLMs and on, this, on the other way, how JNN is going to work with topic models. Now, either way, what we're going to arrive at in the end is a, a document embeddings. So every vertex is a document. And this uh, document is going to have embeddings or representation. And this is what we try to extract. And the idea is that this extracted embedding will be able to represent the semantic content that they get from the documents, as well as the structural content that they get from the graph. Okay, now. And then later on, we're going to investigate a little bit in terms of the downstream applications. What else can you do with it once you arrive at those uh, extracted content? Now, this, in some sense, uh, give us a, a, a good uh, structure to the whole tutorial. What we are talking about now is basically introduction. Uh, later on, uh, Delvin is going to take you through section two when we talk about JNN and Palisade alarms. Uh, I'm going to pick it up from there and talk about JNN plus topic models. And then he's going to come back and talk about the biggest applications of what we can do with these uh, methodologies. OK, so these are essentially the four sections. Now, although we put the summary and the Q&A at the end, but realistically, what we are going to do every section, we're going to open it up for questions in case you have some. And in fact, I think if you find something that is not so clear, you can stop us, and then we will try to cover that as well. All right, so section one is on uh, text related graph and preliminaries. I think we, we kind of get through some of them, but let's take a look a little bit at some of the underlying methods. Um, some of them, if you're familiar, I think I'm going to speed up a little bit, but some of them, let's say, if you're not so familiar, we can go a little bit more into them as well. Okay, so for more definitions, I think this is pretty straightforward. I think we're just introducing notations here. So the idea is that you have a graph, D, uh, vertices, E, edges. Every vertex is a document. We identify them by DI. And every document is a sequence of words in the sense that we, we do maintain a sequence because you might still get some meaning out of that as well. So WIN is going to be the nth token uh, of document I, right? So that's essentially the notation here. Now, the graph itself, we will assume that it's undirected. So the edges are symmetrical. So if two things are connected, they are connected in either way. Now, this is a simplification so that we kind of, uh, it will allow us to describe things in a more generic manner. Uh, but in a way, you know, it, it is possible to extend these things uh, in terms of a directed sense as well. All right, okay, so that's the, now the output, we are gonna learn a Z. Okay, Z is just another vector of some defined dimensions. And the Z of any document is the vector that represents the document. Uh, essentially, it's the embedding of the document. So that is going to be the output. What we, uh, you can think of it as also the output, uh, the, the representation of the graph vertex. So, so in that sense, OK. So the, the key thing is there are some other related work in terms of attributed graphs. But attributed graphs are not identical to text attributed graphs because we don't think that text is identical to regular attribute. In the sense that regular attribute generally still have a limited number of possible values. Whereas I think in terms of text, it's not the tokens that, that are meaningful, is the particular sequencing of the tokens and in a particular frequency that actually gives it meaning. Now, for graph neural networks, uh, we're going just to give a quick illustration. I think the idea here is just to make sure that even people who are not familiar get some sense of what a graph is all about. So this is, let's say, as an example graph, um, A, B, C, D, E. 
and we color code the vertices. Uh, the color at this one of time don't mean much. Uh, they're just identifying different vertex. So basically every vertex of a document has its own color. Now, supposing that we are interested in deriving the representation of a particular right. node A, I think the idea of the graph is that a node is described by its neighbors. That means in some sense, we are trying to look at the topology of the graph, the layout of the different nodes in the graph, and we are trying to describe a specific location. And then in that sense, we got to absorb some information from the surrounding neighbors. So to arrive at a representation of A, we will have to recognize that A, though it has its own features, but we would like to capture the exact location of A by looking at its surrounding neighbors. So in that sense, then B and E will help to describe what A is going to look like, uh, because B and E, uh, by its structural proximity to A, is going to lend some meaning. Just like the way that we make friends, right? We, we tend to influence one another. So no two friends are completely different, because if you're completely different, it's difficult to do things together. So generally speaking, if there is connection, it means that there is some more information in there. Now, but this goes on transitively, because if A is going to be influenced by B and E, then in a transitive manner, B itself is going to also be influenced by D and C, and of course A itself, and E as well by its neighbors. So in that sense, uh, the idea is that to get the representation of A, we can take the one hop structure of its direct neighbors, and A itself is in involved because uh, it's itself. <laughs> and then the two neighbors B and E. Now, uh, in turn, A itself is gonna be in, uh, influenced by A, B, and E, which is the same here, but B then will capture its own neighbors, which is B itself, A, D, C, right? And then E would just be A, E, and F. Now, this is gonna be level two. Now, you, as you can imagine, you can go on to level three, level four, and so on, but of course, there's gonna be an exponential increase uh, in the number of things that we are gonna have to involve. Okay, so let's take a look at B as an example, right? So let's say, so we start with original features. So now we use the notion of H. So basically the, the H here is just a vector, the input uh, feature, features that we consider for a particular node. So H1 will just be uh, uh, the first uh, uh, one and so on, right? Now, in this case, let's say H A, H B, H C. So each one is going to have its own vector. So uh, there's going to be some form of linear transformation, and this is, is usually some form of uh, dimensionality reduction. Because let's say you could start with an in input feature that is the size of the vocabulary, which could be like ten thousand words, right? But you may want to model this in a much lower dimension. So in that sense, then there's going to be some kind of mapping to a much lower f prime. And essentially, it's a, it's a form of um, reducing its dimensionality to something that is more manageable, 50, 100, and so on. Now, so then this is going to be what we call the prime, which is a more compact representation of a node. Then we're going to take a look at what is the influence of the neighbors. And, and in this case, this is a formulation in GET. So just take a look at the representation that we get from a node, let's say B and J. We want to know how much attention is J going to give to B? Uh, in a sense, we are trying to see the affinity between any two nodes. So in this case, how is B related to A? How is B related to B? How is B related to C? How is B related to D? And in that, we can take the concatenation of the vectors that they get and then uh, put it through the activation. And we're going to get a value, uh, which is going to be the attention value. So the higher the value means that there is more affinity between the two vertices. And we can then use a max to normalize it into some form of zero to one. And once we get that, we essentially get a notion of the affinity between each of these input uh, uh, neighbors into B. And in that case, then we can then derive the representation of B as an aggregate of its neighbors. And in that sense, we just need to take into account the representations that we get from each of the neighbor weighted by the degree of attention that they get from each neighbor. Right? So that's now this is what happens in a single uh, layer, right? Uh, now, of course, then if you kind of uh, carry on, then you can imagine that this can happen at every uh, layer. So you can, for example, do this for B. 
And then when you do this for A, then you get a Z of A, then you get a Z of E, and then you can then propagate it further into the next hop and to get into the new uh, representation Z of A. So this is happening all across the graph. So at the end of the day, we get the Z of every node that captures how the features are uh, interplay between uh, one another, depending on the connectivity. So uh, then we can put in some form of objective function because we need some way of training it. And if let's say there is no other information, then in that case, then we have the basic information of the links that exist in the graph itself. Then we can use link prediction, for example, as an objective function that we can use to, to fine tune or to, to basically to train the model that will then get us the, the different weights that we were using in the previous uh, pages. So that's essentially a basic of the graph neural networks, right? Of course, there are much more rich uh, variants of this sort of structure, and maybe even later we can take a look at some of them. But uh, the basic uh, concept here is that they don't deal with text. You can use the graph neural networks any form of features, uh, so long as you can form it in terms of a uh, vector or representation. But in that sense, uh, they may not sufficiently capture the linguistic semantics. Now, you could say, oh, I could always use a separate thing and just you know get uh, the vectors. But in that sense, then we're kind of treating it as a pipeline. And, and that creates a, a bit more of a question as to what should the direction of the pipeline be? Should we pre-process the documents, put it into the graph, or should we pre-process the graph and put it into documents? And this could turn out differently. OK, so all right, so that's the graph part. And let me just take a quick uh, run through of the PLMs. I, I'm assuming everybody nowadays already know about PLMs because this is something that is very popular. Uh, but let's say just to give an example of a PLM, basically it's a transformer. And the basic structure of a transformer is, is this uh, idea that uh, there's going to be a, a parallelized uh, computation of the representation based on attention. Right? So it's like attention is all you need kind of a concept. Now, but even attention, there could be multiple uh, dimensions of attention. I think if you think of, let's say, text data, uh, there could be an attention that is based on the grammatical structure. There could be attention that could be based on the, the gender particles. And there could be a lot of these different types of attention. Therefore, it's common to try to model multiple uh, attention. So the basic concept, uh, what is the representation of, uh, of any particular token in a sentence, right? In a textual um, snippet is basically informed by essentially two things. What is the probable meaning of the word as represented by the word embedding, as well as where the position is, because the idea of the position is to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to in, in incorporate this idea that the meaning of a word uh, must be interpreted in the context of the words uh, surrounding it. Uh, it's just like the way that uh, we could, you know, for example, right? I mean, when a long time ago in school, you probably had this test where the teacher is going to give you a text passage, and then you're going to blank out some words, and then they ask you to fill in, you know, what is the most likely word. And, and most of us, right, uh, if you do well in school, then you'll be able to figure out what those words are. So that's essentially what we do in terms of uh, factoring in the context. And that's essentially what the positional embedding, the position encoding is trying to do. Now, that also allows us to measure some degree of distance, uh, because in that sense, it could be that the dependence is a bit longer. So if, let's say, you have a long sentence uh, where uh, some clauses, let's say, uh, I like to eat ice cream uh, because uh, today is cold, and there might be a tension between the cold and the ice cream, although they may not be directly to, uh, close to one another. So we combined the semantics and the positional signals and then this attention uh, scheme that is in transformers is basically is, uh, uh, is modeled by this QKV idea. Uh, what is the attention value? Well, uh, there is a particular token that we are interested to model its attention, which is Q. And in order to look at it, its attention as modeled by the other tokens, then we're going to take a look at uh, the other tokens in terms of its keys, right? which is query. So actually, we think of it as query to keys. So given a token as E, the web and conference. So let's say at first we are trying to model the word the. So in that case, then we're going to see what is going to be the attention with respect to the other words. So that each one of them is going to take turns to become the K, which is the key. And that's going to allow us to model the attention between every word to, let's say, a target, a query, which is the. 
Now, once we kind of uh, figure out what this attention is, the value of attention, then, then we can combine uh, the representation uh, that will then allow us to absorb uh, the contributions from the surrounding tokens as well. So uh, it's it's actually reminiscent of what we just talked about in terms of graph, but what, where graph is based on this notion of neighbors, uh, whereas uh, here we are is based on the notion of uh, 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 positions of the world. Now, uh, in theory, it's almost like a graph because we are still modeling every possible pair of tokens in terms of attention. But the key difference then is the positional encoding that allows us to incorporate sequential uh, information. So now this is one form of representation that we get based on one particular attention um, parameters. In case, and, and usually we do that, is that you want to model multiple hits. In that case, then there would just be a combination of different types of attention parameters. Then in this case, then we have to learn the QKV for the first hit. We'll have to learn the QKV for the second hit, third hit, and so on. And eventually we get all this, and this becomes then the parameters of the model that we can then use to treat any um, input sentence. All right. So now this is basically what happens in one layer. Then you do just feed forward to the next one and so on. Now, again, PLMs, they deal with text, but they don't deal with graphs. So, so in that sense, um, uh, what we're going to see in the next part, not directly, but let's say later on, is this notion of how can they interplay with the graph. Now, finally, topic models. Okay, this might be something that not everybody is familiar with. Uh, how many of you have been working on topic models? <laughs> so this used to be something that is a lot more popular uh, because I think uh, at that time, the whole idea was to try to derive uh, a way to represent documents in a meaningful way because we do think of uh, text as carrying meaning. And so topic models, in some sense, you can uh, one way of thinking about it is that it's some form of dimensionality reduction for documents that otherwise would be very high dimensional as described by the number of possible tokens. And I think that in that sense, uh, it's um, in terms of the source of the vocabulary. So you input the documents and, and you can't learn topics just from a single document. The idea of topic model is indeed to give me a corpus and then we're going to process a corpus and we're going to look at the different uh, topics in that corpus. So then the output then, uh, if I give you a corpus, then you do something with it, like a topic model. That's like an icon <laughs> uh, representation. Uh, look like a mini LDA, right? So, uh, if you're familiar with the notion of LDA. Uh, but today we're not going to go into this uh, graphical models like LDA because that's uh, uh, probably uh, a little bit too classic for today. Uh, but the output then is going to be a series of topics. Every topic essentially is a, is a distribution of words. So the thinking here is that they make up a topic because these words tend to co-occur together with one another in documents. So in that sense, if you read any particular news, it might be technology news, then it's going to be more likely to have words like technology, phone, internet, and so on. It could be financial news, or market news, then you might have certain things about finances, or it could be media news, like um, you know this um, entertainment weekly, whatever, right? Then you're going to have uh, words like uh, play, movie, theater, and so on. Now, usually, we try to model it in terms of a distribution to give it a little bit of a probabilistic meaning because we understand probabilities a bit better in terms of the higher probability words are going to uh, describe certain topics, and then a document then can be described a distribution over all those topics. So you can think of it as, as different combinations could then be uh, possible as well. So for example, you might actually have a document that is a mixture of all three. It could be they are discussing about the financial prospects of a particular company and a company, let's say Disney Plus, uh, that is focusing on media, but how they are trying to uh, uh, get more sale is by going the plus one, right? Which is the plus side is actually going to the technology side. So in that case, then you might have a particular news article about Disney Plus, but you can have this different combination of different topics to describe pretty much almost any form of text documents. All right, just uh, a, a simpler way to talk about topic models in the context of neural networks, the most common form is autoencoders because autoencoders has a very intuitive way of um, interpreting it as a form of topic model. So you start out with the full document and this input is usually the size of the vocabulary. 
So you have all of the words that can be possibly described in a dictionary, let's say. And then let's say for a word in A, what is its uh, frequency or uh, importance and so on. So you have it for every single word in H. Then it's going to go through some layer of neural networks and, and it's going to finally output some compact representation. And uh, generally, I think nowadays, um, uh, some form of VAE, which is some sort of variational autoencoder, where then you basically model it in terms of what is the mean and the variance, and then there's some form of uh, sampling in order to then regenerate um, the document. Like this is the encoding part, then, then we go out to the decoding part, and in the decoding sense, uh, we get back from the representation what is going to be the eventual document. And then we can then, the autoencoder means that we can test against itself whether we can produce a compact representation that will allow us to model a document. Now, so this middle representation where the compact part in the middle, it has a dimension of K, K being the number of neurons that we use to model it in the middle. Uh, then we can just think of it as the number of topics because then each neuron would have a direct um, meaning in terms of the topic because then if you take one particular dimension and take it as a topic, and then you only turn on that one and the rest are not turned on, then you try to decode it, you will still get some words happening, right? Then in that case, then those words are going to be a description of that particular neuron, which in this case we interpret as the topic. Okay, so uh, now then the decoding part, this part, right? Basically, we have a word called a beta. Uh, essentially, you take a neuron and you look at the weights that are coming out to every possible word. This is essentially words in the vocabulary. And that essentially is what we call a topic because then uh, the different weights, if there is a higher weight, this word is considered more important. If there is a lower weight, then it's gonna be considered less important. And to maintain its probabilistic uh, interpretation, then you can softmax it, and then you basically get a distribution over the vocabulary. And this is what we consider to be topic. Now, this there is still a, a, a consistent uh, part in the particular modeling of topic, all the way back to the notion of uh, things like LDA, latent clear allocation, and, and those uh, before as well. All right, so, so essentially any document is a combination of its compact representation, which is a distribution over topics, uh, and then uh, multiplied by the topic representation in terms of words. And that give us the notion of topic model. All right, it's just that in LDA, this will have been a probability distribution, this will have been a probability distribution, uh, and model by graphical models. Okay, then finally, we can, uh, in terms of training the model, because essentially we are doing autoencoding, so we're just going to test whether the eventual decoded one is uh, close to the encoding one. And that can then be used in terms of cross entropy loss to train the weights that are involved in the encoding and decoding. Okay, so now what we've been through so far is really just um, the fundamentals of uh, these different uh, models. What we're gonna do a, a bit uh, later on is that uh, it's gonna be about how these three things that we just talked about, the graph neural networks, pre-trained language models, topic model, how do they come together in order to incorporate signals from both graph and text. Now, uh, this will be done next by Delton, but just before that, in case any clarification that you want to ask at this point of time? Yes, please. So for the clarification, yeah. um, it's not that long that we're going to flash it. So, uh, do you think that for the variation of encoding, I mean, like ground truth for the pair of topic and uh, Document to train model. Of course, what is what is the process? Of okay, topic? I see. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. The question is that uh, in training this topic model, let's say based on auto encoders, do we need some ground truth in terms of topic and documents? Right. Yeah. So I think the the answer is no. So uh, it is you can almost think of it as basically some unsupervised learning. Uh, what we're actually trying to learn is the topics themselves, and we don't have the ground truth. And therefore, we would have to learn them uh, as 
uh, essentially lower dimensional forms of the document. So, so in that sense, uh, the idea is that the, this document, when they get compressed into these compact representations, and they are going to be k neurons in the middle, those are the topics. And then, then you can then uh, try to decode it, try to decompress it, and then you get back the original long representation in terms of the words, and, and you see whether those are similar to this. Now, what is a cross entropy? Well, in this case, in that sense, you can think of it as every word has an occurrence uh, in the original input and the output. And then we are basically comparing whether when it appears in the input, does it also appear in the output, or it doesn't. And we try to get it as close as possible. Now, uh, but it's easier to overfit if you just deal with, let's say, very few documents. Uh, but because we deal with a the corpus, then the same weights that we use with encoding and decoding, they have to fit many documents. So in that case, then the beta, the basically the, the topics that we're going to get, uh, is it has to be something that can be generalized to many documents in the same corpus. But also through their uh, sharing, uh, their presence within the same corpus, generally it means that they have some common topics. Yeah. So for example, like financial news from Reuters, then they're all going to be financial stuff, but maybe some things about commodities, some things about stocks, some things about uh, interest, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Then maybe at this point of time, I am going to pass it to Delvin. Uh, and he's going to take us through how pre-trained language models can be combined with graph neural networks to do this in a more uh, uh, seamless manner. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing at the moment. And yeah, Delvin, please go ahead and uh, you can share your screen. Okay, yeah, yeah, the screen is okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now let's continue with uh, section two. So for section two, uh, we mainly talk about the combination of pre-trained language models and graph neural networks so that we want to propose a unified model so that the unified model can deal with text attributed graph. And this section uh, will last around uh, 45 minutes. So specifically for this section two, uh, we have four subsections. First of all, let's introduce the first subsection. It's pre-trained language models for a static text attributed graph. So first of all, what is a static text attributed graph? That means we observe the whole text attributed graph at once. So existing works for static graph can be split into two uh, architectures. One is the cascaded, the other one is the nested. So below here, is an illustration of two architectures. Uh, first of all, let's look at the left-hand side one. The left-hand side one is the cascading architecture. So for example here, so suppose we have three documents on top. So these three documents are connected with a graph. And suppose we want to learn embeddings. So cascading architecture means we first apply pre-trained language model on each individual document, and then we obtain their embedding. So for this specific example, we have three embeddings. Each embedding corresponds to one document because we have three documents in total. And then we apply graph neural network on top to aggregate these three embeddings. This is why we call it cascaded architecture. But the disadvantage, disadvantage of this cascaded architecture is that graph neural networks and pre trained models don't have interaction. For example, at the very beginning, when we do encoding with pre-trained language models, we don't use graph neural networks. That means graph information cannot enhance the encoding of pre-trained language model. So this is why we propose the second architecture on the right-hand side, which is nested architecture. So for nested architecture, pre-trained language models and graph neural networks are nested at each individual layer so that both textual content and graph structure can interact with each other at each layer, so that in the end, the output representation can unify both modalities. 
So specifically for this subsection, we focus on the nested architecture. Specifically, I present a model called a graph former for the static scenario. And here, this model is illustrated by the figure on the right hand side. So similarly, we still suppose we have three documents and these three documents are connected on, as a graph structure. And we want to learn embeddings for these three documents. First of all, the first step is that we want to do feature initialization. Because each document is a sequence of words, right? So we input the sequence of words into one layer transformer, and then we obtain their initial embeddings. So this process here is illustrated by the formula on the left hand side. Here, di here, the input di is a sequence of words. And then we input to one layer transformer and we obtain h. Here, h is a sequence of token embeddings. You can see on the right hand side, it's a sequence of token embeddings. The first token is the CLS token. CLS token represents the embedding of the whole document. The remaining, the remaining are token embeddings. Each token embedding represents one token or one word. But now we just finished one layer transformer. So the next step here is to do graph aggregation using graph neural networks. Because we have three documents here, right? We want to aggregate their embeddings so that we can capture graph structure. And in the end, the output of this graph aggregation is one single embedding, and this embedding has both textual content and graph structure. So this graph aggregation is done by graph neural network illustrated in previous section. So we input one document i, as well as its neighbors, j here. j is the neighbor of document i. Here we take the CLS token of documents, mainly because CLS can represent the embedding of the whole document. So this is the input of graph neural network, and as the output, we obtain ZI here. ZI is the output of from graph neural network, and it should capture graph structure. But remember, the input of this graph neural network here is token embeddings of CLS token, right? CLS token is output from our previous transformer. That means CLS token should capture text information. So in the end, the output Z here should capture both text and graph structure. So the next step is that we want to capture both information. So we concatenate graph embedding with our previous token embedding. You can see the formula here. We Z here is the graph neural network embedding, and H here is the output from previous transformer. We concatenate graph neural network embedding with transformer embedding. And the result h hat here should capture both information. And we input h hat to the next layer transformer. And then we obtain the new embedding, h2. Remember, transformer is a contextualized modeling. So after one layer transformer, the result h2 should capture both text and graph. For now, we just finished from one, layer one to layer two, right? Just now we have initialization and then we have graph neural network and then we have transformer. So each layer has one neural network, uh, each layer has one graph neural network and one layer transformer. So we repeat this process for maximum L layers and then we can obtain the final embedding. So for each layer, we have graph neural network transformer, graph neural network transformer, graph neural network transformer, this is why we say this architecture is a nested architecture, because two models are nested at each layer to better integrate both text and stru uh, graph structure so that we can output unified document embeddings. So as the output, we obtain HL. This is the output from L layers. So finally, if you want to optimize the whole model, we use contrastive loss. The contrastive loss is based on link prediction on the graph. Let's look at the numerator. So the numerator is the inner product of two document embeddings, i and j. And I, are j, I and j are connected on the graph. So we want to maximize their similarity because there is a link between them. There must be some semantic similarity between these two documents. So let's look at the denominator. 
So we also want to minimize the similarity between document I and negative samples. And specifically for contrastive loss, we use uh, in-batch negative samples. In-batch negative samples mean we want to use other documents in the same mini-batch as negative samples. And then we minimize the similarity between document I and other documents inside the same mini-batch. So we use this contrastive loss to optimize this model until convergence. After convergence, for a new document, we can input it to this model graph formal, and then we can obtain its embedding. Then we can use its embedding to do downstream tasks. So now let's look at the performance of this model. Authors try on three different data sets. For example, for the second data set here, the second data set is called DBLP. We have more than 4 million documents on the graph. And each document here, on average, has more than nine words. The first experiment we want to do is link prediction. Link prediction here means we want to predict the links on the graph. If the quality of document embedding is very high, then similar documents should be embedded closely. If there is a link between two documents, then these two documents should have similar embeddings then we should have high similarity between these two documents. So now, given one query document, we provide it with 300 samples, but only one of them is the positive sample. All other 299 samples are negative samples. We want to see if the current model can rank the positive sample as high as possible. Below is the performance. First of all, let's compare the proposed model graph formal with this pre-trained language model. This pre-trained language model doesn't have graph structure. It models text only, but not graph structure. So now we can see there is a significant improvement. This improvement verifies that the current proposed model graph formal can indeed capture graph structure to improve the performance. We also compare the current model with these cascading architectures. These cascading architectures, first of all, use pre-trained language models to encode each individual document. And then we apply different types of graph neural networks to aggregate the document embeddings. As mentioned earlier, the disadvantage of cascading architecture is that pre-trained language model and graph neural network don't have interaction. So we can see the performance. There is an improvement. The improvement further verifies that the proposed model graph formal can indeed use nested architecture to improve the performance over cascaded architecture. Now let's look at the second uh, subsection. Uh, it's about pre-trained language model for heterogeneous text attributed graph. So sometimes documents are associated with metadata, right? For example, documents have authors who read the document and manuals where the document is published. For example, if documents are academic papers, then papers have authors who read the paper, right? We also have my publication menu. So for papers, if some papers are written by the same author, they should discuss similar research topic. Right? For example, one researcher should have his own, his own specialized research topic. So most of the papers published by the same author should talk about similar concept or come from the same research area. Or similarly, if, paper, uh, if documents are news articles, then we have journalists. And usually one journalist is specialized in writing a certain category of events. Let's further look at the figure on the right-hand side. So we have four academic papers, A, B, C, D. We have three authors and two venues. So if we don't read the specific content of these four papers, but instead we only look at the authors and menus, we still can guess the main concept of these four documents. For example, document A is published on CVPR. Then most likely this document talks about computer vision concepts. Similarly for documents B, C, D, they are published on KDD. So most likely they talk about data mining concept. Similarly for authors, 
if you know author one is a computer vision researcher, then even though we don't need to read the content of the paper, we still can know paper A most likely talks about computer vision. So this is why we say, if we know the authors and venues, we can better understand the meaning of the document. So such a graph is called heterogeneous graph. We have documents with this metadata. However, there are two challenges. The first challenge is that previous works, including the previously mentioned graph form, don't consider metadata. They mainly consider the connections across different documents, but they don't consider authors and venues. The second challenge is that some metadata, like authors and venues, they don't have text data. They are just identity. So we also need to find a way to model such textless node or uh, authors or menus. So specifically, today I present a model called heteroformal and it's published on uh, KDD 2023. So this model is illustrated by the figure on the right hand side. So suppose here, we want to learn the embedding for the central node here, right? This central node. And this central node has neighbors. Let's look at the previous figure. Suppose document C is the central node. Then C here has two document neighbors. They are B and D, right? And B and D have textual content. So we say they are text rich neighbors. So we put B and D on the left hand side. Similarly, for document C, it also has two authors and one venue, and these three neighbors don't have text data. So we say these three are textless neighbors, we, and we put them on the right-hand side here. They are textless neighbors. The goal of this model is to learn embedding for the central document, and we want the embedding to capture both text-rich neighbors and textless neighbors. The first step here, is to do node feature initialization. Let's first of all look at how we do initialization for textless neighbors. So for each textless neighbors here, right? For each neighbor, we randomly initialize an embedding called Z. And then we multiply Z by a learnable parameter W. And then we can obtain a new embedding H. So for these three neighbors, we have three different embeddings, H1, H2, H3. Similarly, for text-rich neighbors, we also want to do initialization. Since they have uh, text already, we can directly use one layer transformer to initialize their embeddings. DI here is a sequence of words or tokens. We input them to one layer transformer, and then we can obtain token embeddings. We use H to represent the token embeddings. Specifically, H is a sequence of embeddings. Here, the first one is CLS token, and the remaining embeddings are token embeddings. So after initialization, we do aggregation. So for textless, textless neighbor aggregation, we apply graph neural network. So suppose I here, I here is the embedding of the central node. And the remainings are the neighbor set. So we input both the central node and textless neighbor into graph neural network, and then we can obtain a new embedding. We use Z to represent. This process is illustrated by the red box on the right hand side. Right? We can see the red box. We input both central node embedding and textless neighbor embeddings. Also, we have text-rich neighbor embed aggregation. So we can see the red box on the right-hand side. We input the embeddings of text-rich neighbors and the central node. Similarly, we also use graph neural network. So the input has two sides. The first one is the document I embedding. The second one is the text-rich neighbor set. As the output, we obtain a new embedding Z. So now, after step three and step four, we have two embeddings. One is textless neighbor embedding, one is text-rich neighbor embedding. So finally, we want to aggregate them into the central node. 
so that we hope the embedding of the central node can capture both textless and text-rich neighbors. Specifically, we do concatenation. We can see we concatenate two Zs with H. H is the embedding of the central node. And then we obtain a new embedding H hat. And then we input H hat to the next layer transformer. Similarly, for now, we finish one layer. One layer consists of both graph neural network and transformer. And then we repeat this process for maximum L layers. And then we can obtain the final embedding H. Right? Each layer has graph neural network and transformer. Then we repeat this process multiple times. Then graph neural networks and transformers are nested at each layer. And finally, we obtain the embedding for the central document. And then we use this embedding for uh, we use this embedding to do link prediction as the loss function. Similarly, we still use contrastive link prediction loss. We optimize the whole process using this loss function until convergence. So after convergence, if we want to infer the embedding of a new document, we input this document as well as its text-rich and textless neighbors. And finally, we can obtain the embedding of the new document. Let's look at the experiments. We test on three different data sets. For example, for the first data set, DBLP, we have more than 3 million academic papers, which are documents. We also have venues and authors. For venues, we have more than 28,000 venues. For authors, we have more than 2 million authors. The first experiment is link prediction. First of all, let's compare with those models without any graph structure. So they have text only, but not stru graph structure. So the improvement here is because we indeed capture graph structure to improve the performance. Here, graph structure is heterogeneous graph. We also compare with those models without any metadata. They have graph structure, but only within the documents. They don't have authors or venues. Specifically, graph formal, as mentioned just now, is one of the baseline models. It doesn't have authors or venues. Here, we still observe an improvement. And this improvement is because the current proposed model can indeed capture both authors and venues or other metadata to further improve the quality of document embeddings. We also compare with those models with metadata, but but they are mostly cascaded, uh, they are mostly cascaded architectures. So the improvement is still because the proposed model is a nested architecture so that it can better integrate different modalities into unified document embeddings. The next experiment is node classification or text classification. We want to classify what category a paper belongs to. And similarly, we have the same observation. The proposed model outperforms existing baseline models, including models without any graph structure or models with cascading architecture. The next scenario is textual age text attributed graph. So sometimes documents appear on edges instead of nodes. Just now, we present graph formal and hetero formal. Both of these two models have documents on the nodes, right? For example, we have papers, and papers have citations. Papers are nodes, and citations are links. But sometimes, documents can appear on edges. For example, on the left-hand side, we have online user product review graph. Each node is a user of a product. If a user buys a product, he may leave a review. And the title review here appears on the edge between the user and the product. And similarly, on the right-hand side, we have email communication graph. So each node here is a person. And if two of them exchange email, then the email is the title document appearing on the corresponding communication edge. And the goal of such scenario is that we want to learn embedding for both edge and node. Remember previously, for graph formal and hyper formal, we only learn embedding for node because each node is a document. But now we want to learn embedding for both node and edge. We specifically 
uh, we specifically present a model called age formal, which is published on ICLR 2023. Age formal has two uh, variants. One variant is for embedding on age. The other variant is for embedding on node. First of all, let's look at how we learn embedding for age. This model is illustrated by the figure on the right-hand side. So suppose we have two nodes here, the red one and the blue one, but these two nodes don't have tags, but instead the tags appears on the edge between them. And our goal is to learn embedding for these tags on the edge. Again, at the very beginning, we have feature initialization. We input this text, a sequence of words, into one layer transformer, and then we can obtain the embedding. Here, we use age here to represent the embedding of this text or age. Now let's look at the next step. We want to capture graph structure. So we concatenate graph embeddings with token embeddings. This process is illustrated by the red box on the right-hand side. We can see this is one layer transformer. In addition, we also concatenate those token embeddings with two more embeddings. These two embeddings are node embeddings because we want to capture graph structure. So these two node embeddings are specifically designed by Z on the left-hand side. We can see ZI and ZJ. So after concatenation, the new embedding H hat should capture both node information and text information. And then we input H hat to the next layer transformer. Right? So we repeat this process multiple times. So we repeat concatenation and transformer, concatenation and transformer. We repeat this process for maximum L layers and we, uh, we can obtain the final embedding H here. And finally, as the loss function, we use H classification using cross entropy as the loss function because each H may have its own corresponding ground truth category. For example, if this text document is email between two people, the email may belong to either normal email or spam email. So we want to classify if the current email is spam, then there are two categories and we want to use the embedding to classify this age of email. Similarly, if this document is review between user and product, then we want to classify this review into one rating or, five, or, two, seven, or two rating, three rating, four rating, or five rating. So it's a five-way classification. So now we finished the model for learning embedding on age. Now let's look at the next model, how we learn embedding for node. This model is illustrated by the figure on the right-hand side. Here, suppose we have three, uh, we suppose the central node is the red node, and the red node has three neighbors, blue, green, and uh, blue, green, and green. Each edge has its own textual content. So the overall process is similar as our previous model, the only difference is that we want to have one more embedding here, one more token embedding. This token embedding is obtained by this no local network aggregation. Because for now we have three documents, right? We want to exchange information among these three documents. So for each document, we have a document embedding or age embedding. And then we input them to multi-header attention on the left-hand side, uh, on the left-hand side equation. So we have three embeddings, right? We input them to multi-header attention to exchange information. Multi-header attention is a mechanism to exchange the information and aggregate information. So as the output, we have H bar. H bar should capture information of all three documents. And finally, in addition to our previous two node embeddings, we also concatenate H bar here. So we can look at the figure on the right hand side. So in addition to two node embeddings, we concatenate one more embedding, which is obtained by this local network aggregation. And then we input this result to the next layer transformer. So we repeat this process multiple times. And in the end, we have the global edge aggregation. Because here, 
the central node red node has three documents, and we learn the document embeddings. And finally, we aggregate them to obtain the red node embedding. This aggregation is given by the formula on the left-hand side. It's basically a tension. We first of all evaluate a tension for each document. So we have alpha, and then we do weighted aggregation, weighted summation. And in the end, the result is one single embedding H. And this H embedding is on top, it's node embedding. And as the loss function, we can use link prediction as the loss function to optimize the whole process. So now we try this model on a few data sets to see the performance. For example, for the first data set, it's an e-commerce platform data set from Amazon. And we have more than 173,000 nodes and more than 1 million ages. So first of all, let's look at the, comp uh, look at the comparison of age classification. Now we learn embedding for age and we classify age. Let's see the classification accuracy. So we compare the proposed model with this cascading method. The cascading method here uses pre-trained language model for each individual, uh, each individual age, and then they do aggregation to capture graph structure. And there is still a significant improvement. And this improvement is because we use nested architecture to further integrate both graph structure and texture data so that the result embedding is a unified embedding. We also have the performance on link prediction. This is the result for, uh, for the node embedding. So we first of all compare the proposed model with those cascading models. And again, the improvement is because the nested architecture can better integrate information. So finally, we introduce how we do pre-training on text attributed graph. So what does pre-training mean? So we are given text attributed graph G here. So we want to train the model and optimize its parameters in a self-supervised way. We only use two observed data, textual content D and graph structure E. We don't have any other auxiliary data. So after pre-training, we can obtain a model with optimized parameters. And then we use the pre-trained model to do fine-tuning tasks. So we are given the pre-trained model, and then we further optimize its parameters with a specific downstream task, for example, text classification. Here, in order to do text classification, we need to observe one more data, which is the ground truth category of each document. But the ground truth category here is not given at the very beginning. This is why we say for fine tuning, we need to use auxiliary data to fine tune the parameters of the model. Here we present two methods for pre training text attributed graph. One is called pattern, the other one is called specter. First of all, let's look at pattern. So pattern is the pre-training method for graph formal presented earlier. So now let's quickly review what is a graph formal. So remember we have three documents and we want to learn their embeddings. We first of all input them to one layer transformer and then we obtain their embeddings here. And then we do graph neural network aggregation. After the aggregation, we concatenate with previous token embedding and then we input to the next layer transformer. So one layer, neural net, one layer graph neural network, one layer transformer, one layer graph neural network, and one layer transformer. So we repeat this process multiple times, and then we can obtain document embedding. Right? Finally, we can obtain document embedding. So now let's look at how we do pre-training. There are two parts for pre-training. The first part is mass language modeling. So before we input this model, we randomly mask some of the words in this document. For example, we replace some of the tokens with mask token, or we randomly replace some token with another random token. So the document is a bit noisy. As the output, we want to use the output token embeddings to recover the ground truth document. 
this recovery process is done by the formula on the left hand side. For the mask token H here, we multiply it by a learnable parameter W, and then we do sub max over all the vocabulary. And we can obtain the probability for the current word of the token. And we want to maximize the probability of this token. So we we repeat this process for every mask token. So this is how we do pre-training using mask language modeling. The second part of pre-training is mask node prediction. This is basically the same as our previous contrastive laws. So given two documents I and J, if they are connected or linked together on the graph, then we maximize their similarity at the numerator. And similarly for denominator, we minimize the similarity between one document I and other negative samples. And finally, the pre-training loss is the combination of these two parts. So we optimize this pre-training loss until convergence. Now we finish pre-training. Let's look at how we do fine tuning. So suppose we use text classification as the downstream task for fine tuning the model. So for each document here, it has CLS embedding, right? CLS represents the embedding of the whole document and it should capture both graph structure and text data. We first of all input this CLS embedding to a multi-layer neural network. And then we use Supermax to normalize the probabilities and we can obtain class probability. And then we compare the predicted class probability with the ground truth class probability P here. And then we use cross entropy as the loss function. So for text classification, each document should have its own ground truth category. For example, email is spam or not, academic paper is machine learning or data mining or computer vision, right? So finally, we have the cross entropy loss for text classification, and then we optimize this loss for fine tuning the model. Below, I illustrate the second fine tuning process with another task, link prediction. For link prediction, we still use contrastive laws here. But the difference is that for previous pre-training, we have both contrastive laws for link prediction and mask language modeling. But now we don't have mass language modeling because it's no longer our objective. Our objective is to do lean prediction. This is why we maintain lean prediction only. We can fine tune the model on different downstream tasks. And we try the proposed pre-training method written on five data sets. So now let's look at the performance. So if we compare Python with this category of models, they are the models without any pre-training. Specifically, graph formal is one of the baselines. It doesn't have pre-training, but instead it directly trains on the given text attributed graph. So there is an improvement between the proposed model Python and baseline models. And the improvement is because we have pre-training process and the pre-training process can help us preserve the information on the graph. Similarly, we also compare the proposed model with this category of models. They have pre-training, but only with math language modeling. They don't have node prediction. Here, the improvement is because the proposed method pattern has link prediction, so that we verify both math language modeling and link prediction are useful objectives to improve the performance. Finally, we also do ablation here. We respectively remove mass language modeling and node prediction from the complete model and see if the performance drops. And there is indeed a decreasing performance. So the decreasing performance here means each individual pre-training method, uh, each individual pre-training objective is useful so that by combining both of them, we can further improve the performance. Now let's briefly look at the second pre-training method called SPECTRE. So SPECTRE is a simple method for academic paper citation graph. So suppose here we have a query paper. For query paper, it has connected cited paper 
we use relative paper to represent it. We also have the unrelated paper. We have P minus. So we put all three of them into the same transformer, and then we can obtain three embeddings. And suddenly, we use a triplet loss as the pre-training loss. So what is a triplet loss here? The triplet loss is given by the formula on the, on the top here. So for the first term, we want to minimize the Euclidean distance between the query paper and the related paper. Let's look at the second term. The second term is to maximize the Euclidean distance between the query paper and unrelated paper. We use this loss as the pre-training function and we pre-train the model and the convergence. Yeah, so this is basically uh, section two. As in section two, I present three different scenarios for text attributed graph. The first scenario is static scenario. The second one is the heterogeneous scenario with metadata. The third scenario is the textual age scenario where documents appear on edges instead of nodes. And finally, for the fourth subsection, I introduce how we do pre-training and fine-tuning on text attributed graph. Yeah, we welcome questions. Great, yeah. So if you have a question there, yes. I'll just say it out. I'll try to repeat it so that you can hear it. Uh, I didn't quite understand the local entry aggregation and where it uh, uh, goes into the engine. So can you clarify how this is done? Local entry aggregation, how that uh, it a goes into, uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, Delvin, I think the question here is on the local edge aggregation. Uh, how does it uh, get incorporated into the multi headed tensions? Uh, is it edge formal? Is it here? Yeah. Yes. This is the one. Okay. So, for multi headed tension, so the goal of this multi-head attention is to do aggregation among different three, uh, three different documents. We want to exchange the information. So specifically, we can look at the, the, the graph on the right-hand side here. So we have three different documents, and we want to use multi-head attention to exchange the information. So specifically, for multi-head attention, for each document, uh, for each token here. So for each document here we evaluate its attention with all three of them. And then we can obtain three attention values. And then we do weighted submission. Because this is multi-head attention. So we repeat this process for multiple heads with different parameters. And finally, we do concatenation and obtain the final output, which is H bar. So for short, multi-head attention here is just a tension mechanism with multiple heads. So for simplicity, you can understand it as one head attention. So we do attention and then we do aggregation. Uh, uh, there's that aggregation that goes into one of the edges, right? So what happens after aggregation? Does it go into the edge? Oh, so for aggregation, we still obtain three different embeddings. So each embedding corresponds to one page. So here we have three different documents. So after multi-head attention, we obtain a new document embedding or edge embedding. And a new embedding captures all three of them. All right. All right. Okay. So uh, now, now actually just nice for the break. I think there is a, a copy break going on outside. Uh, we do hope that you're going to come back because I think we still have pretty interesting stuff that we're going to talk about after the break. All right, so I think then we're going to pause here for a moment and then we're going to start again at 11. All right, everyone. I think, first of all, thanks for coming back. Uh, I think uh, uh, we're going to follow through with the rest of the topics. I think before uh, the break earlier, we first of all went through the introduction, which is basically part of uh, the basic techniques for graphs. 
uh, between language models as well as uh, topic models. Uh, and then Delvin took us through how is it that we could combine the pre-trained language models as well as uh, graph neural networks to work together in a seamless manner to the graph representations for the graph. So uh, in this second part, uh, basically we're gonna do two other sections. In the section uh, three, which is what we're gonna do shortly, uh, I'm gonna take you through some of the works in which we can join topic modeling and graph neural networks, basically in a more seamless way so that we can incorporate some of these graph structures into topic modeling directly. Uh, and then after that, uh, Delta is gonna bring us to the last part, which is also pretty interesting, which is on the applications of these different representations. So, because once you've got text attributed graph, you do graph representation, so what can you do with it? And it turns out that uh, there have been different works that try to uh, apply it to different things like recommendations, uh, classifications, and so on. Okay, so without further ado, uh, let me take you through uh, this next part. Now, this is basically part three, right? Topic model based text attributed graph models. You now, uh, a lot of it basically already have papers behind them. So, really, I think to get into the details and so on, you could actually always go back to the papers, but I'm going to focus on the major. Uh, concepts that we try to incorporate, especially in terms of the kind of signals that uh, we try to make use to for this sort of works. Okay, so more or less, there are going to be three subtopics. Uh, the first one is actually the basic, which is topic modeling, uh, usually based on autoencoders, uh, combined with uh, what we call static graph. It's actually just a regular conventional graph with uh, vertices and edges. Uh, then we start to take into to look at uh, more complex structures in a sense that sometimes what we call text attributed graph could actually be uh, containing additional signals. So in some cases, the graph may be heterogeneous in a sense that they have different types of vertices. It's not all documents. It could be other types of vertices as well. And, and then the last part is to, you know, you can even, even infer hierarchies. Uh, in sense like taxonomies or hierarchies to model this idea that what we call topics might not necessarily be flat. They could, uh, in fact, have some structure to them uh, themselves in the sense that they are more general topics, they are more specific topics, and they might be interlinked to one another in terms of the structure. Okay, now, uh, starting from the static graph, we're going to talk about two works. And they, it's actually very intuitive. I think we... If you focus on what the key idea is, now this is autoencoded, or at least a representation of it. You have the documents, which is the input representation, usually in the high dimensional vocabulary space. Then through one or more layers, you put it through the autoencoder, then you get a compact representation. And this is what we call the topic uh, distribution, because then each uh, neuron in the middle here becomes like a topic. And then the weights that come out of the neurons that decode into the, the, the original documents, right? These are individual words in the document. That is what we call topic, because in that sense, if it is high on certain words, then that could be topic, let's say, about, uh, let's say, finance. If it is high on other words, they could be about health and so on. Now, the idea of autoencoder, especially the auto part, incorporates this concept that there is no supervision. The only thing that we need is just the document itself, and we try to reconstruct the same document at the input and at the output. And that is uh, what autoencoder is about. So, but we want to incorporate the graph. Now, how do we do that in a more intuitive, uh, natural way? And, and this is where uh, we start to think about things in terms of what we call the adjacent encoder. By the way, this is just another representation of this. This is what we call topic, right? which is basically this part. And the red uh, edges coming out with the weights, these are going to be uh, the, or the individual words. Uh, for example, like graph neighbors, these are different words and so on. Okay, now if autoencoders, you reconstruct the same document. You put in A, you reconstruct A. Now, but because we have a corpus of documents and they're all interlinked in a graph uh, uh, manner, like in a connected way, uh, now there is this idea that, well, the intuition is that you have these different documents and there must be a reason why they are linked. And, and in that sense, uh, what we begin to introduce is this concept that maybe 
an autoencoder that actually learns to reconstruct neighbors might actually absorb some of this information that connect documents together. So in that sense then, in this what we call adjacent encoder, uh, then the input document and what is essentially being reconstructed are going to be different. So we start with A, for example, we can reconstruct D because let's say A is connected to D. So, so in that sense, then we are basically training. It's almost like, a, a, you know, in similar structures would be like the denoising of the encoder. So in the denoising case, you basically create a pseudo uh, document where you basically mask some of the words within the document. And the idea is that uh, you don't want to overfit. So you try to capture the general latent uh, structures. Uh, in this case, it's similar to that, except that instead of what we call denoising being uh, something that is masked from the document, essentially the, 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 the noisy version then would basically be a neighbor. So that's, that's the key concept. Now, the rest of it is basically implementation, right? So in, in the sense that how do we make it work? Of, of course, it's non-trivial, but uh, that's the key concept. So this is basically the simplified diagram. Now, uh, once we do that, then, um, okay, if we break down some of the underlying things, but basically it's uh, the notion where you start off on the document and then this is the autoencoder structure, they were gonna get a media representation. Now then, and then we can incorporate some of the neighbor attention. So in this case, we just take a just directly inner product between one node and another node, and the inner product essentially uh, is proportional to the similarity between the two documents. Uh, then we're gonna get again a neighbor aggregation, which is going to absorb the neighborhood structure. Now this is gonna be the encoding part. Now then, the decoding part is going to reconstruct a document. So in this case, in the loss function, uh, we have dj as opposed to di. So in that sense, then the di prime, which is the encoding of document i, should be decoded into a neighbor document j. And once we train in this way, so then it, the autoencoders will try to generate similar representations for neighboring documents. Now, this is an example of the experiments. Uh, there are more in the paper, but this is just one of the things to you know, just to illustrate how the effectiveness of this approach. Uh, there are four data sets, uh, they're all from Cora. So these are acronyms for data structures, hardware and architecture, machine learning, programming languages. So these are different uh, Cora subsets. Now there are classes, but these classes are not used for learning. They are basically gonna be used just for the evaluation. And then these are basically the size of the documents, ages and vocabulary. Okay, we, we compare this to a lot of different autoencoders. So basically all these things are autoencoders, denoising, contrastive, variational, uh, case sparse autoencoder. And <laughs> Kate, I think is another form of the sparse autoencoder. And then uh, a number of them are uh, basically topic models, uh, RTM, plane, these are still graphical models. And uh, FIJE is a variational graph autoencoder. So these are models with a graph. These are models with a graph. Uh, but in this case, as an autoencoder is showing our performance in terms of classification. These are very basic classifications, such as like nearest neighbor classification, because the idea is not to over rely on the classification algorithm, but more in terms of the quality of the features that we extract. Okay, so these are just some examples of the topic coherence, uh, basically topics one. Okay, so you get words such as um, Markov MDP, Markov decision processes, of observable uh, states and so on, right? Or uh, you get another one, topic two. Again, you have different things like k-nearest, neighbor grid and so on. So, so I think the idea here is that every topic tends to group together words that co-occur with one another. So they incorporate the notion of they are related, like they are a concept. It's testable because usually the way that it's tested is that you look at the frequency or co-occurrences on an independent corpus and take a look at whether or not they reflect the natural co-occurrence frequencies. So two words in the same topic, you would expect them to co-occur more frequently than if they are from different topics, right? So in that sense, uh, a measure that is often used in topic modeling is this idea of pointwise mutual information. But the idea is that you get mutual information for every pair of words in the same topic. So 10 words, you get 10 choose two, you get 45 pairs. Each one of them, you check what is the uh, 
uh, the mutual information, then you're going to have uh, you, you average them across these uh, pairs. Now, the higher the value, you would expect them to be better. So in this case, again, it's just an autoencoder, generally also has this higher coherence. Now, what, what is the key idea? The key idea really simply is that the edges that you get from the graph, they supplement uh, the insufficiency of words. Sometimes we don't use all the words uh, that are necessary to describe everything. I think in this experiment, we, also, we only use either the titles or the abstracts. But basically, they are relatively sparse. Uh, input now in that case and the edges of the graph could then supplement that uh, now an alternative to that right so i mean building on that concept but you can then think of uh, different ways to incorporate even more sophisticated objective functions or models so just an encoder is basically an the underlying it is still an autoencoder uh, now in the case of dbn this is a different piece of work uh, is essentially is to try to incorporate the optimal transport. Optimal transport is a different from objective functions, just to give you a sense of what it's trying to do. I mean, think of it as you have some distribution of loads, uh, let's say distribution of H that you want to see how to transport it into a different distribution, let's say call it D, right? In this case, this is the number of topics, this is the number of uh, uh, words, uh, that's the dimensionality. Now, the sizes of the circle just uh, is a visual representation of uh, how big the load is, like how important or how high the probabilities are, right? So let's say 0 0.9 is a bigger circle than 0 0.2, for example. Now, then the idea is to, to determine how similar are these. So in determining similarity, we got to figure out how do we transform or do we have a way to transform one distribution to a different one? And in the optimal transport uh, scheme, uh, this is modeled by two matrices. There is what is called the transport cost. Basically, is the cost of going from any one row to any one column, right? To any one, let's say, in this particular row to this particular. So, okay, what is the cost? Now, the fact that this is a large circle means that it's a high cost. So, it's it's kind of like the way that we take airlines, right? So, like uh, you're figuring out how to go from some city to another city. And, and different destinations are going to have different ticket prices. So in that case, then, is modeled by this, the cost. Now, then we have to figure out what is a transport plan. A transport plan uh, is a way where we're going to redistribute the load such that we're going to, you know, row-wise is going to sum up to the original load here, and column-wise is going to translate to the, uh, the size of this uh, dimension here. So for example, let's say in this case, it means that out of this value, let's say this blue one, uh, across a row, you're going to contribute different load across uh, to different parts of the words. And uh, in the other way around, for a given word, this value, okay, well, how do we get it? We get it from multiple topics, for example, and these are basically the columns. Now, this transport plan uh, is, we have to optimize it. This is called optimal transport. So once we figure out the optimal transport, that minimizes the cost. So to minimize the cost, we have to avoid those high cost areas so that we are going to transport a bigger one, let's say, right? Bigger load uh, where the cost is lower. If the cost is high, such as this big one, right? Then we won't transport so much, for example. So then in that case, then uh, we can figure out in terms of uh, this particular uh, if you can figure out an optimal transport plan, then it's going to minimize the overall cost. That means that the, the more similar these two distributions are. So then the whole point of the modeling is then to figure out what is the representation that we can derive such that we can minimize the overall cost. Now, that is intuitively understood as by what is this cost matrix. And this cost matrix, essentially, you can think of it as almost the topic word distribution itself. Because then we are trying to figure out what is the representation of a topic. So this is the G, right? And E is the individual words. So we are trying to figure out what is a topic embedding that is going to give us, um, well, low cost means it's very similar to the words. So in that case, then it means that you pick some of these topics. It means that it's going to allow you to easily go into the words that are low cost. Now, once we figure out what is a P, the P is going, okay, the C is derived by the embeddings from the topic and the words, and the P is a transport plan, and we will optimize that. We figure out the minimum value of P, then we get the distance. 
and the smaller distance, the better it is. So then this is just a different, a bit more sophisticated objective function. But then it does show up in terms of the performance uh, as to even, even better than the adjacent autoencoder. Because then this is a comparison to the adjacent autoencoder. So this is a document classification. So again, what we see here, 66 is pretty much higher than the previous ones, including the previous adjacent autoencoder as well. Okay, so uh, these are a couple of models for what we call static graphs. Uh, they are, okay, so static simply means they are conventional graphs. Uh, they, they are also uh, different variants for dynamic and so on, but you know we, we don't cover everything. But if you're interested, you can let us know, and then we can point you to the relevant papers as well. Okay, so topic of Higgins is the same, right? So those are the static graphs. Now, we kind of want to branch out a little bit into two different aspects. Uh, in particular, what we see is that the structure of the graph, they are not always just flat uh, conventional graphs. Sometimes they have additional information. So one form of additional information is in the form of heterogeneity in the vertices. Okay, what do we mean? Okay, so it's, it's more easily understood by uh, an example, right? Let's say this is an example that's familiar to many of us, like papers. So for example, if I ask you, okay, what, how do you pick a paper to read? Now, of course, you can find by keywords. Uh, you search in Google and then you find keywords, right? But chances are that's not what we do. Chances are we have some other heuristics that we use to identify relevant papers. For example, you may go by author. Oh, this is a famous author uh, and I got his previous papers uh, and I kind of like the topics that he's working on. And therefore, if I follow this author, I'm going to get more similar topics, right? So in that case, author is an important uh, representation of meaning and concept as well. Uh, sometimes we follow conferences because, okay, oh, I generally publish in the, the web conference or KDD or CBPR, and that conference also captures a set of topics or meanings as well. Now, so the idea here is that, well, these are diff essentially different granularities of concepts or semantic representations. And if we can incorporate all of them within the same uh, structure, then we might be better able to learn the topics within uh, the whole corpus. This is a model called VGATM, right? Um, now, in this case, what we now consider the corpus is a slightly more involved, like slightly more complex. Uh, the vertices now are not just documents. We are going to add a couple more things, authors, venues. So these are additional vertices. Uh, you can almost think of it as they essentially form a multi-layer structure to the graph. So there will be the document layer, and the documents are related to one another. Uh, there are the word layers, and the words are related to one another. There are authors, and authors co-author with one another. And then there are venues as well. Now, and then the edges will cut across different types of vertices. So documents has words. So in that case, it will cross the two layers. Uh, document has an author or multiple authors. So in that case, then there is a crossing between authors and documents. And then uh, documents has venues, right? Because you publish a document in a particular venue. So uh, the word layer graph, okay, there are different ways you can construct the word layer, but I think the basic idea is just to take into account how our words are related to one another. Uh, in this case, we consider uh, multiple concepts. I think one is the notion of semantic uh, similarity. So if you take two words and you take their embeddings and you measure their cosine, then in that case, you get a sense of whether two words are related to one another. Uh, you can look at syntactic. So there are various types of NLP a parsing that you can do on these, uh, let's say, textual sentences. And sometimes they can actually detect this static dependency. So let's say in that case, you can also use that and measure how similar the words are. Uh, there's also just the context, essentially the neighbors. So if you define windows, and within these windows, and we look at how many times they're co occurring with one another, then in that case, then we can see how similar the words are just from the fact that they co occur within the same documents. So there are multiple types of similarity. You can consider any subset of them, but in this particular work, we consider all three of them. Okay, now you've got a uh, text attributed graph, four layers. So then uh, we can break down the, uh, the modeling into two types. One is what we call intralayer. Intralayer meaning it will work within each layer. So because there's a graph within a layer. 
So there is a graph just for documents. There's a graph just for authors. There's a graph just for the words and so on, right? Now, the way we can think of it is that uh, we built on the notion of graph neural networks. So in this case, graph convolution encoded. So the basic idea really is that uh, within a layer, you essentially apply a GNN mechanism such that you get a representation for every vertex. Uh, that usually means that you go to find what are the attention values to all the different uh, neighbors, and then you aggregate the representations into the nodes. Now, uh, you can do this in multiple layers, right? Because this is the, the notion of graph. You can go one hop, two hops, and so on. Uh, the notion here is that you will input how many layers you want, and then we reserve the last layer for the cross-layer part. Now, all these things happening uh, at first within each respective layer, and then we're going to look at the cross layer. Now, first of all, because we have three word layer, to simplify it, we will compress them into a single layer just by mean pooling. So that means that you have the contextual, syntactic, semantic, they all get compressed into one, which is just the word uh, layer representation. Then we look at the cross layer. And in this particular structure, it so happens that the cross layer is always relating to a document. So because words connect to document, authors connect to document, uh, venue also connect to document. So document becomes a centerpiece that brings all these different uh, uh, vertices together. And in that case, then we are going to derive the cross layer representation, essentially another graph uh, 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 propagation, but across layers. So in this case, HW will be the representation of the document that it gets from the words. Uh, HU will be the ones that we get from the authors, and then the, there is going to be another one that is going to be from the venues, right? HV. Right? So those uh, representations that you get from the different layers, then you combine it with the representation that your document gets from its own layer, and that essentially gets us the overall representation for the document. Then in the decoding side, uh, in this case, then uh, we will uh, essentially do negative sampling. Because in this case, uh, one of the things that you can do is the relationship between documents and words. So we can take a look at which words are actually occurring within the document. So those are the positive cases. And what are the words that are not occurring in the document? And those are the negative cases. And that's essentially used to uh, train this. So now this is an example. So in this case, then we take into account uh, data sets that actually has the heterogeneous structure, because then they have authors, uh, uh, venues, and so on, right? And just to kind of uh, briefly show you the improvements, these are different models without authors or venues. They are essentially just straightforward uh, uh, topic models. These are models with authors or venues. Uh, and, and in this case, we basically have the complete model. And, and in that case, then we are performing better, essentially. And I think this is basically just because you get uh, my my uh, intuition is that because uh, these different vertices capture uh, different splits of topics, because like CBPR, like as a venue, has a much broader type of a uh, topical representation. Each author was the combined papers, and and that gives it a, a bit of a smoother way to relate these different uh, documents together, because documents that have similar words are similar, but documents by the same author also has a different kind of similarity. And documents at the same venue, again, have even a higher level type of similarity, higher meaning, like more general type of similarity. Okay, this topic of here right, so. Okay, I'm just gonna go through one last part, which is on the notion hierarchy, and then I'm gonna pass it to Delvin to talk about applications. So this notion hierarchical text attributed graph is, is to uh, essentially recognize the limitations of uh, some of the spaces in representing hierarchical information. Uh, in particular, uh, if we think of uh, the topics that we want to learn as having some form of hierarchical structure, um, in that sense, you know, even when you guys were doing these papers for the web conference, the last part when we asked you to do the camera ready, uh, you had to go to this ACM taxonomy, and then there's going to be a very long set of subtopics and so on, right? So the idea is that there are more general topics, there are more subtopics, there are even more specific topics. And so if you think of it in that way, and that uh, that hierarchy, texture representation, topic representation has a notion of hierarchy, and so is graphs, because then there are 
sometimes a centerpiece vertex that everybody wants to connect to. And that kind of a, um, uh, goes outwards. I mean, think of it as, let's say, a very productive uh, researcher may have a few students, and then the student may have their own students, and so on. So if you look at the lineage of the whole thing, the graph will soon uh, go out into exponentially into the spaces. Now, if we, this is what we are trying to represent, either in a graph sense or in a textual sense. Uh, but uh, then we have to question the suitability of the kind of spaces that we want to use to represent uh, these types of structures. Now, in this example in particular, right? So you look at uh, the topical in the middle, the centerpiece, let's right, say, uh, there's only one of them. And then directly you might have two or three or four vertices, but it kind of branches out. By the time you go to the outside, is is an expon exponentially higher number than the ones that you can represent in the in the center. Now there is some limitation of uh, ex uh, Euclidean spaces in order to do that because the spaces that you have it gets more and more crowded uh, the further outward that you go, and, and therefore now uh, things that are not the same can get squeezed because there is just no more space, and then they they may look like they are similar when in fact they are not. So that's kind of a, the underlying idea of the hyperbolic space, which is to try to uh, better model this notion. And you can think of it in this way. So let's say this is a spherical structure, and this is like a 2D plane, right? Now, uh, if you represent it in the spherical structure, it is a naturally hyperbolic in the sense that the center, uh, and as you go outward, you can actually cover a bigger and bigger space. Because that's the, the whole idea of a sphere. As you go down, you actually cover more and more space, right? Now, so which means that if you try to represent a taxonomy, for example, the roots can be up there. And then you, as you go down, you actually can distribute uh, the children of the roots. Uh, and even as they have further children, the space actually grows. And this growth of the space with uh, the, uh, further out from the root they are, uh, essentially give us a bit more leeway to model, uh, to get a representation, to model vectors in a higher dimensional space, because then they are not as crowded. Now, that can have a, a Euclidean uh, equivalence in the sense that you can then project from the sphere up to the Euclidean space. And then you can see if you project it, let's say if you kind of a shine a light <laughs> from below. And, and then in this case, things that are further out actually would then start to look they're very similar again, because then meaning that the things here that looks very crowded, if you think of it in a three-dimensional way, then you project it into the screen, right? Then you can actually create more space, but in a 2D space, they will actually be more crowded. So that's the basic idea in the sense that let's not uh, model everything in the, in the Euclidean space. Instead, we go to the hyperbolic space, then maybe we are going to get better representations. So that's basically the key concept that uh, we try to model. And in this case, let's say, in trying to model the hierarchy, uh, we do something similar to what we are seeing in terms of the encoding and decoding. The only difference now is that uh, we, we, we do the, what we call a hyperbolic representation, which is essentially you take representation, you uh, map it to the, uh, this is hyperbolic space. Uh, you try to map it to the Euclidean space so that you can then take some a transformation, then you can go back to the exponential space, which is the hyperbolic space. So then by, by basically going through these uh, two spaces and maintaining the Z representation in the hyperbolic space, we hypothesize that we're going to get better representations. So that's the idea, right? So that is a hyperbolic graph neural network. Now you get that in the, in the graph space. Now we just tried now to link it to the topic word space. And in this case, this is now essentially the cross layer encoding because uh, the document graph is on one space and that's hyperbolic model. And then now we want to kind of go to the word space to model the topic. And here we, okay. So one of the things that we try to model is this notion of the topic tree. So we initialize the tree, let's say three levels and each one has certain number of uh, children and so on. And here we can kind of, uh, each one of them is a topic, so they will have their own topic embedding. And to model a particular, uh, which topic it is that you're going to have, 
then we're going to see, okay, what is the probability of a path? A path basically going all the way from the root to the leaf. So let's say this is path 2, k1, k2, k6, right? So then the probability of that path is the probability of k1 multiplied by the probability of k2 given k1 and so on. Now, what is k2 given k1? Well, you look at the similarity between the representation of the child to the parent. So essentially, the, the more similar the child, like the favorite child, then there's a higher probability. The less similar the child is going to be the less probability. So now, if you want to know what is k5 given k2, for example, then you do something similar uh, just in the next level. Now, this is one thing about what is the distribution across all the paths. Basically, then you have as many paths as you have leaf nodes in that sense, right? But in order to pinpoint a particular topic, then we have to estimate what is the level in which the topic is going to occur. So are we discussing, okay, this particular document is about path two, but is there more emphasis on the root or is there more emphasis on the K2 or is there more emphasis on the K6? And this is kind of what we try to figure out with the level distribution. And the way that uh, we kind of look at uh, which uh, level it is, right? We basically just look at uh, the document's representations, and then we're going to look at uh, the distance to these uh, different uh, levels. So in that case, then we basically find uh, for a given document, uh, which of the different levels is it going to be closest to? And then we presume that it's going to be the level that's going to be assigned to that uh, document. All right, so then overall, then we can assign a given document with a distribution over all the topics in the topic tree. So basically, then there's going to be probability value that you can attach to every node in this tree. And then we can reconstruct it in terms of um, how those distributions is going to map back out to the topic words. In this case, the beta will be the topic word distribution. It's going to be the parameter that we learn. And given the probability over these different topics, and then how they're going to be decoded back out into the words, then we get a representation for that uh, document, but back in the word space. So let's say, okay, now in this case, we test it against some topics. Okay, they are mostly, um, again, document structures, but they can model the graph as well. And we are comparing those models with graph hierarchy, but without a text. So kind of like ablation type of uh, thinking. Uh, some have text hierarchy, but they don't model the graph hierarchy. And then the HD, HGTM basically is the is the model that we propose that has both of them, right? And and that's kind of showing a better uh, performance overall, exceptions uh, A minor. Uh, and A minor is particularly sparse. So I think maybe that's got some reason to do with it. So topic coherence, this is also doing pretty well as well. All right, so this is kind of a, a, a summary of uh, what we just talked about earlier. And I think kind of a try to link it back to the different things that we've talked about so far. The first part we talk about, okay, what is graphs? Okay, what is text attributed graph? It has graph, it has text, but in a natural integrated way, it's not two different things. They are basically two sides of the same document. And, and therefore, how do we model them in, the, uh, in a seamless manner? So then in part two, um, Delpin has covered the idea that, okay, maybe we can model the text with uh, pretty language models. And then how do we incorporate that with some of our graph neural networks? Now, this third part, I think we mostly talk about different forms of autoencoders, different forms of autoencoders as a representation for topic model. And then how do we incorporate the notion of a graph within that? But we can also take a look at a little bit more uh, complex structures like uh, heterogeneity in the graph, uh, hierarchical structures in the graph, and then we can then uh, show that some of these uh, input features actually have value. Okay, there's only one more part, which is on the applications. But before we get there, any clarifications that you want to ask? All right, okay. So anyway, we can, we can always take more questions at the end as well. Uh, now, I think with this, uh, let me get uh, pass this to Delvin so he could uh, bring us through the next part, which is how do we apply this to different uh, problems? Yeah, Delvin, go ahead, share your screens. Yeah, so uh, the last section, uh, I will talk about the applications challenges and future directions of text attributed graph. 
So specifically, uh, the last section has four subsections. First of all, let's discuss uh, text classification, how we use text uh, attribute graph to do uh, text classification. But first of all, let's understand the concept of text classification. So suppose we have a corpus of documents. Suppose this corpus of documents is uh, emails. So some of the emails are spam emails and some of the emails are normal emails. So we want to design a classifier, a model, so that we can classify them into two categories so that the normal emails can go to inbox and spam emails go to spam folder. And in order to design such a classifier, we need to understand the textual patterns within each email so that we know some of the words may frequently appear in spam emails and some of other words appear in normal emails. Similarly, on the right hand side, this is the academic paper classification. So each academic paper can be classified into, for example, data science category or machine learning category or computer vision category. So we classify the uh, papers based on the patterns of the words the paper uses. So specifically, we want to use text attribute graph in this section to do text classification. But what's the advantage of text attribute graph? The advantage is that we have one more graph structure in addition to text. And graph structure here is the auxiliary data to complement textual content because usually connected documents tend to have similar semantics. And we want to use graph structure to bring those connected documents closer so that they tend to be classified into the same category. And in this section, we present a model called G2P2. And this paper is published on uh, CAR 2023. So this model has both pre-training and fine-tuning. For pre-training, we first of all input text attribute graph in this model and we want, we want to optimize the parameters. As the input, we have two sets. The first set is graph structure here. The second set is a corpus of documents. Specifically for graph structure, we use graph neural network to capture the graph information. So we input graph data on the left-hand side to graph neural network and we, we can obtain new, a new embedding Z. Similarly, for textual document, we use DI to represent and then we input DI, a sequence of words into transformer and then we can obtain text embedding T. So for each document, it has two embeddings. One is obtained by graph neural network, which captures graph structure. The other one is obtained by transformer capturing textual content. The next step is to do uh, is to design pre-training loss functions. The first loss function here is the text node interaction. Because each node here on the graph has two embeddings. One is opted by graph neural network, the other one is opted by a uh, transformer. So we want to align them. We want to maximize their similarities. So specifically, this process is done by the red box on the right hand side here. So we can see the blue embed, uh, the green embeddings here are the graph neural network embeddings. And the yellow embeddings here are text embeddings. We use contrastive loss to maximize their similarities. The diagonal elements on this matrix are the similarities between the same document. You can see the first one is Z1, T1. They correspond to document one. And similarly for the second one is Z2, T2. They correspond to document two. So the diagonal elements are the product of one document. So we want to maximize the similarity of the diagonal elements. At the same time, we minimize the similarity of non-diagonal elements because non-diagonal elements are mismatch. This process is done by the formula on the left-hand side. So we first of all take the inner product of Z and T, and then we do cosine similarity. And then we compare the cosine similarity with the diagonal matrix. And we use cross entropy as the loss function. So we want to maximize the elements on the diagonal and minimize the elements on other, um, not on the diagonal. 
So this is a two-way process because for cross entropy, cross entropy only focuses on each row. So the first cross entropy focuses on each row and obtain the loss. But now we also want to obtain the cross entropy for each column. So for each column here, we do transpose of this matrix and then we do cross entropy. So the transpose of the cross, the transpose of the matrix here means each row becomes each column. So previously we use cross entropy for each row, right? So after transpose, the cross entropy is applied for each column. Now let's look at the second loss function. It's the text and summary interaction. So for each text on the graph, it also has neighbors. So those neighbors can also represent or reveal the main semantics of the central text because documents are really connected and connected documents should have some similar semantics. So if you look at the neighbors of a document, we can also roughly guess the main semantics of the central document. So this is why here, we first of all do mean pooling for ice neighbors. We do mean pooling for ice neighbors and then we can obtain a new embedding S. This S represents neighbor embedding or summary embedding. And similarly on the right hand side, we maximize the similarity between the central document embedding P and its neighbor embedding S. At the same time, we minimize the similarity between the central document T and other known neighbor embeddings. And then we can obtain a new loss function L2. Finally, the third loss function is given by the node and summary interaction. Here, for the green embedding, it's output by graph neural network, it's C. And for S, it's the summary embedding. So we also want the graph neural network embedding of the current document to have high similarity with its surrounding neighbors. So we also do the same process between Z and S. And then we maximize the diagonal elements and minimize non-diagonal elements. So finally, we combine L2, L1, L1, L2, and L3 as the, our final pre-training loss function. And then we pre-train the model and optimize the parameters until convergence. So after convergence, we apply this model for fine tuning on text classification downstream tasks. Specifically, this paper presents two fine tuning processes. One is zero shot, the other one is few shot. Zero shot means we don't observe any labeled documents. We directly apply the pre trained model to all non labeled documents and we want to classify them. Specifically, we rely, we rely on prompt tuning to do this process. So first of all, we construct a prompt on the left hand side. The prompt is given by paper of class name. Here, class name is a placeholder. We can replace it with the name of each individual label. For example, on the right hand side, we can see there are n classes in total. Suppose the first class is natural language processing. The second class is recommendation and the nth class is computer vision. So we replace the class placeholder here with the class labels, category, category names. So for example, for the first one, we have paper of natural language processing. For the second, we have paper of recommendation. So for each class, we have its own prompt. And then we input the prompt here. We input the prompt into transformer, and then we can obtain the prompt embedding, which is W. Because we have N classes in total, right? We have N classes, we obtain N Ws. Each one corresponds to one class. And finally, finally, we input the current uh, document to graph neural network and we can obtain its graph neural network embedding. And then we compare the similarity between the current graph neural network embedding and each class embedding W. We see which class has the highest similarity with the current graph neural network embedding. Suppose the first one has the highest similarity on the right hand side figure. Then we say the first class is predicted by our model. 
all the input document should belong to the first class. This is zero short fine tuning. Now let's look at the second scenario, which is few short fine tuning. For few short fine tuning, we observe a few labeled documents to train a to fine tune the model. And then we apply the fine tune model to remaining unlabeled documents and we want to classify them. So similarly, we have prompt. But the difference here is that we replace previous word prompt with learnable embedding prompt. Here, for learnable embeddings, we have M embeddings, H1 to Hn. So they are learnable embedding vectors. And then for each embedding here, we initialize them with documents. So for example, for the current document I, we have M words. For neighbor document I, we also have M words. We take mean pooling for the current document and neighbor documents, and then we can obtain M embeddings. These M embeddings are our prompt embeddings. We will optimize them later. So for each class, for each uh, class, we have their class embedding here, H, and we concatenate class embedding with our previous M learnable prompt embeddings. We input all of them together into transformer. But remember here, transformer is fixed. The parameters of this transformer are not optimized, but instead we only optimize the input prompt embeddings. The purpose of doing so is because this is few shot learning. For few shot learning, we only observe a few labeled examples. So we want to avoid overfitting problem. We don't want to optimize the parameters of transformer because transformer has too many parameters, but we only have a few labeled examples. But instead, we only optimize prompt embeddings. The number of parameters in prompt embeddings each is fewer than the number of parameters in transformer. So we can avoid overfitting problem. And finally, for each class, we can obtain the class embedding W here. And then we compare the similarity between the current class embedding and graph neural network embedding and see which class has the highest similarity. And finally, we output the class. So this is how we do fine tuning. We use the, a few label examples to do fine tuning and optimize the prompt embeddings until convergence. So after convergence, if we observe a new document, we input it to the model together with prompt embedding, and then we can obtain class embedding. And then we compare the similarity between graph neural network embedding and class embedding and see which class has the highest similarity. We conduct experiments on four different data sets. For example, for the first data set, Cora, it has more than 25,000 documents. And the number of links or edges is more than 192,000. So let's look at zero-shot test classification accuracy. For zero-shot test classification, we don't observe any labeled document. And we can see the proposed model outperforms baseline models. And those baseline models mainly deal with text data. They don't have graph structure. So the outperformance here is because the proposed model G2P2 considers both text and graph. So then we say graph indeed brings useful information and improves text classification accuracy. We also look at the performance of five short text classification. So similarly, the proposed model G2P2 outperforms baseline models. Now let's look at the second application, question answering. We want to know how we use text attributed graph to do question answering task. So why can text attributed graph bring useful information to better answer the questions? Here I give you an example. Let's look at the figure here. So the left gray document here is the central document and the red purple document is a hyperlink document on Wikipedia. I suppose this is a Wikipedia hyperlink graph. Let's look at the purple sentence on the left-hand side, the National Cherry Blossom Festival. So basically we know the left document talks about the Cherry Blossom Festival. 
However, it doesn't reveal too much information about which country the festival belongs to. But if we look at the hyperlink document on the right hand side, we discover that it's Japanese cherry trees. That means if we know the hyperlink document, we can better understand the current information, which means the linked document reveals that the National Cherry Blossom Festival celebrates ch Japanese cherry trees. This is why we say if you look at the high order, high order connectivity or high order documents, we can obtain more knowledge so that we can use more knowledge to better answer the current question. So specifically in this paper, I present link board. Link board here is a model for hyperlink document and we want to answer some questions. Link board is published on ACL 2022. So for link board, it's designed with board, but it has graph structure. So first of all, we look at how we do the input to this link board model. So we have three different types of input. The first input is link document. So we have D1 and D3. So D1 is the central document, and D3 here is a hyperlinked document. Let's look at the figure on the right hand side. So suppose this is document one. So document three is also connected with document one. And we input both document one and document three to this book model. We concatenate them with a separation token in the middle. So after encoding, we obtain a new embedding H. So this H should capture both document one and document three. Now let's look at the second type of input. We replace document three with a random document on the graph. Here, suppose we choose document five as a random uh, sample. So document five is not connected with document one. So we input both document one and five into this model and we can obtain a new embedding. The third type of input is contiguous document. Basically, we have one more subset of document one. The subset is called D1 prime. We input both document one and its subset into this model. And finally, we obtain the output H. So we need to do, we need to see how we deal with this model. We need to know how we train this model so that the model can capture graph structure. So we use two pre-training loss functions. The first one is mass language modeling or MLM. So we use the output token embedding here, H. We multiply it by a learnable parameter W, and then we do soft max over the vocabulary. We want to predict the mass words because at the very beginning, before we input this bot model, we randomly mask some of the words in the input document. For example, we can randomly replace some words with mass token, or we randomly replace some word with a negative word. So at the output, we want to use the token embeddings here to recover the mask tokens. And we use cross entropy as the loss function for this objective. We have the second pre-training loss is relation prediction loss. Relation prediction means Previously, we have three types of input, right? So we want to classify what's the current input. We use CLS token. So suppose we have the embedding CLS token for the first one, right? For the first input, then we need to know the current input should be linked documents. If the CLS token comes from the second type of input, then we need to know the current input is random documents. Similarly, the, for the third one, it should be contiguous document. So we take CLS token embedding and we input it to a classifier, which is a one layer neural network with softmax activation function. And, can, and then we can obtain P hat. P hat here is a three way classification probability. And then we compare P hat with the ground truth, a, a classification uh, category and then we use cross entropy as the loss function. Finally, we have two loss functions and we can, we can combine them as one single loss function and then we pre-train this model. 
so that in the end, this model can capture graph structure because the graph structure is captured by the second loss function, which is the relation prediction. We want to predict the relation of the input to document. So after pre-training, we can apply this model on question answering downstream task and fine tune the parameters. Here we test on six different data sets. And authors also propose two versions of LinkBird. One is the general LinkBird. It's pre-trained on Wikipedia hyperlink graph. Wikipedia has general information. So the first model LinkBird can be applied to general question answer task. The second model is bio LinkBird. It's pre-trained on PubMed citation graph. PubMed is a biomedical paper citation graph. So the second model is more domain specific. It can answer questions about biomedical domain. First of all, let's look at the performance of the first one, general link bird. We do question answering, given a document and the question uh, and the question as input. We want to identify an answer span from the document. So we want to know which part of the document tells you the answer of the question. So now the authors compare the proposed link bird with the traditional bird model. We can see for the first row here, right, is the performance of bird, and the second row is the performance of link bird. There is a significant improvement over bird. The improvement here is because link bird can indeed use hyperlink information or graph information to improve the performance. This improvement also verifies that graph structure indeed brings useful information and higher order knowledge so that we can better answer the question. The second experiment is biomedical domain. We use two data sets here. Now let's look at the comparison. If we compare the first two columns, the first model is a baseline model, but it doesn't have graph structure. The second column here has graph structure. So the improvement is because graph structure is indeed useful. If you compare the second column with the third column, we discover that the third column uses large bird instead of the base bird. That means large bird has more parameters so that it can memorize uh, more knowledge and information so that it can better answer the question. Now let's look at the third application, which is citation recommendation. So when we write academic papers, we usually need to cite other related papers. So is it possible that when we write a sentence or a paragraph, the system automatically provides some citation recommendations to us so that we don't need to manually search on Google Scholar? The answer is true. This is called citation recommendation. But why can we use text attributed graph to do citation recommendation? It's because academic citation graph is also a kind of text attributed graph. Each node here is an academic paper and each link is a citation. So now we convert citation recommendation into link prediction on the graph. So given two papers, we want to predict if there is a link between them. And the link here is the citation relationship. Specifically in this paper, we present a model called GNCTN. It's published on TOIS 2021. The model is illustrated at the below figure. Specifically, we have input encoding. So we use graph neural network to encode the current text attributed graph. We input the current central document DI and its neighbors DJ. And then we obtain uh, two embeddings, mu and sigma. Because this model is designed with variational autoencoder, we obtain mu and sigma as variational parameters. The next step is to do reparameterization. So mu is the mean. And then we randomly sample a variable from Gaussian and multiply it with covariance. The result theta here is the result from our reparameterization. But we further add one more variable here, epsilon. The purpose of this epsilon is to distinguish similar documents so that this is a random variable. So after adding this epsilon, 
Similar documents should also have a little bit different embeddings. And finally, we have two decoders. The first decoder is text decoder. So we use the embedding of the current document and input it to a multi-layer neural network. And then we can obtain the reconstructed text data. And then we compare the reconstructed text data d hat with the ground truth text data. Here, the ground truth text data is a bag of word representation. And we use cross entropy as the loss function. And we can obtain L text. As the second decoder, we have citation decoder. So we concatenate two documents and then we input them to another multilayer neural network. And we want to predict if there is indeed a link between them. So this is a classification problem. And then we still use cross entropy as the loss function. And the final loss function is the combination of these two. And we optimize the model and apply it to a new graph and see if we can predict, uh, we, if we can recommend citations accurately. We test this model on three different data sets. For example, for the first data set, set you like, we have more than 16,000 documents and more than 44,000 citations. We first compare the proposed model with the first category of models. There are the models without any uh, this, they are the models with first order graph. The proposed model has graph neural network and it can capture higher order information. So that the improvement is because we use higher order information to better make citation recommendations. We also compare with these models without any text decoding. They have citation recommendation decoding, but not text decoding. We outperform them, mainly because we indeed capture text information so that we can use both text and graph to make better citation recommendation. And finally, there are, the, there are also the models without any higher order encoding. So we still outperform them because we indeed capture higher order information. So finally, I would like to introduce some challenges and future directions of text attributed graph. So one future direction is about explainability. So now our models can achieve quite a good performance, but usually we are usually very curious about why a model makes certain prediction. We want to know the we want to know the explanation so that we can know why the model has such a result. However, previously we have a model called GNN Explainer. This model pioneers the explainability research. It can explain which subgraph structure is important to make the current prediction. However, the drawback of this model is that it doesn't consider text data. But now we are dealing with text attributed graph. We have both text and graph. So one future direction here is that maybe we can design a model so that it can jointly incorporate both text and graph so that we can provide two explanations. One explanation is that which subgraph is important. The second one is which text spans are important for predictions. Now we have two sets of outputs. One is graph, the other one is text. And we want to use both of these two sets to explain the model behavior. So far based on my observation, this is not yet done. Let's look at the second future direction. We have hierarchical pre-training, mainly because existing text attributed graph pre-training methods, they treat all the documents equally. However, sometimes documents have hierarchical structure. For example, for example, if this is academic, academic citation graph, then papers may have survey papers and regular papers. Survey papers can usually summarize a broad area, but regular papers deal with specific research problems. If this is news article corpus, then some of the news articles may report general Olympic games, but other news articles may report specific match or event. So documents are not equally important, or sometimes they have a hierarchical concept. 
Some of the documents talk about general concept, but some other documents talk about specific concept. However, existing pre-training methods treat all the documents equally. They don't distinguish such a hierarchical structure. So one possible future direction is that we want to model such document hierarchy so that we can better preserve the textual semantics. We can better preserve how documents are hierarchically organized in the corpus. If so, the model parameters can be better optimized and pre-trained. Yeah, finally, uh, this is the summary. So this is the section four and I present uh, three applications and, and two possible future directions. I presented a uh, text classification, question answering, and citation recommendation. And for future directions, I presented uh, both exp explainability and hierarchical pre-training. Yeah, so hope we can explore text attributed graph together in the future and hope we can advance the research uh, frontier of this uh, topic. Yeah, this is end of the current tutorial. Thank you very much. We welcome any answer or uh, questions All right, so uh, that's essentially the end of the presentation parts. Let's see if there are any questions. Yeah, just go ahead. May I ask what, uh, what types of like uh, graph substructures can GNN display or actually explain? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah. So Delphine, I think the question is, uh, what type of graph substructures does GNN explainer actually explain? Okay, so, uh, so for this paper uh, called GNN explainer, so for this paper, uh, because one document may have many uh, neighbors, for example, a document may have five neighbors, and those five neighbors may have other neighbors, right? So for GNN explainer, it outputs sub graph structure. For example, only two of the neighbors are important for the prediction. And among these two, maybe because these two documents may have further neighbors, and only a subset of their neighbors are also important for the current prediction. So it outputs a sub graph structure. It doesn't output the whole neighbors, but only a few of them are important for the current prediction. Afterwards, if your direction of the future research works well, then would we be able to like compare if uh, some subgraph structure is more important or like the structure is more important in terms of like uh, prediction or that's like the direction that you are. Okay, so the question is is the future research direction essentially is to look into identifying which is more important. Is it the graph structures or is it the text structures? Uh, here, uh, I think uh, what you are saying is important. We can see uh, graph or text, which one is more important. But at the same time, we can also check uh, both of them. Maybe some of the sub graph structure is important, but at the same time, Maybe within those, because we only look, suppose a document has five neighbors and suppose two of them are important, but this is graph structure. But within the textual content of these two neighbors, which textual span is important or which sentence within these two documents is important for the current prediction. So this is the textual aspect. So the we, maybe we can jointly look at both graph and text span and see, and we use them to jointly provide explanation for the current prediction. But what we are seeing is also interesting. Maybe we can also design another method to check graph and text, which one is more important for the current prediction. Right. All right, okay, so uh, I think uh, we want to emphasize that, you know, uh, Delvin really wants to be here. <laughs> but I think because of uh, uh, visa situations, and I think he has to present remotely. 
Uh, I hope the tutorial has been informative. I think we will uh, post the link to the slides, maybe also inside the WOBA, so you can still find it later as well. And feel free to connect with us if there are parts of this that you find interesting, that you want to discuss more and so on. So otherwise, and I think we thank you very much for uh, spending the time with us and, and, and being so involved and uh, asking questions and so on. We really appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Uh, Samsa, do you want to post? Can you uh, look into the first slide, like a uh, section one, slide one? I was thinking we can take a picture. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> if you guys don't mind, let's take a picture, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Is this one? Okay, hold on. So, let me. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so. Yeah. Okay, if anybody wants to join us for a picture. No? Yeah, since you guys have stayed here for the last few hours. Yeah. Okay, just make sure that this still is a note. <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah. Come on, come here, come here. Okay, um, just uh, come two steps forward so that uh, you can get the light screen on your face. Yeah. Okay, ready? Uh, just help me to move in. Uh, put to your one step to your right. Everybody, one step to your right. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Ready? One, two, three. Now, wait, one more. Hold on. Okay, ready? One, two, three, now. Okay. Okay, looks good. Thank okay. you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, what else should I be doing? Uh, Mitchell. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I can yeah, go. Hi. <laughs> oh, is it what you're doing already? Uh, I was in uh, one job yesterday. Oh, I just put the <laughs> so it's not that long, right? It's a direct flight, probably. Good night, Jangja. We go for lunch. <laughs> Is, this, is, it, is this someone uh, speaking to Prof Hadi? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is, is he Michi? Who? Who? Michi, Michi, a Japanese student. No. No, no Japanese no, student here. Korean. Korean student. He's Korean. Huh? Korean. He's Korean. Korean, Korean. Okay, okay. You want to just show up your face and you have to take <laughs> your face so that we can see you. Uh, yeah, can you can you see yeah. you, Wait, hey, hi, uh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you for the yeah insightful talk. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I, really uh, I will be available on Wowa. Uh, you can also connect uh, connect me uh Wowa. Uh, all right, yeah, definitely. If I have any questions that I uh, yeah, all right. Yeah, when I look at it, connect. Yeah. yeah, he's actually in the US. So yeah. Oh, really? He's actually in the US. Oh, yeah. So I see. What university are you Great. from? Yeah, I'm in yeah. university, uh, USC, University of Southern uh, California. USC. Yeah. Who's your supervisor? Mm -hmm. Who, who's your supervisor? My advisor is Emilio Ferrara. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, are you? Uh, do you also do research uh, about graph neural network and uh, text data? Uh, mostly I do work on like detecting misinformation. So like much oh, of the, okay. my work is on like applied side, but like I definitely needed to like um, to understand this. Yeah, 
overall concept of GNN and also, and also like text attributed. Yeah. Okay. But like actually, uh, I'm a postdoc in US now, and my research is also about uh misinformation oh. detection, oh, like really? fake news detection, rumor detection, and fact checking. Mm -hmm. So this is also my current uh, research topic. Right. Uh, maybe you are also working on some on something similar, like rumor detection, misinformation detection. Yeah, my, my uh, workshop presentation yesterday was like on like uh, misinformation detection on uh, using like fine tuned LLMs. But I when I dig in more, more, more and more into this topic, uh, I felt like, yeah, only the textual data isn't sufficient for like yeah. information detection. I mean, there's a lot of like literature on like graph. Uh, integrating graph structure, yeah, right? Yeah. So yeah, I need I needed this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> needed actually, this recently too. for me, I'm working on combining knowledge graph and a uh, text data to mm -hmm. do a uh, misinformation detection. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna check out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe you can connect me on a uh, Vova, and then maybe we can share uh some of our information and background. Maybe uh we can have some collaboration in the future. Maybe. Great, yeah, that would be lovely. Yeah, yeah, nice to meet you. But are you a PhD student? Yes, I'm a second year PhD student. Yeah. Okay, okay. But you know, at the same time, there is another tutorial about misinformation detection. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. One one of the organizers was like from uh, our lab, so like <laughs> I was oh. very much familiar with most of the stuff there. So yeah, I, I chose okay. to stay here. Yes, come here. I noticed that maybe that tutorial is from Professor Yan Liu. Yeah, yeah. I looked okay. at the slides and, but like, yeah, some of the things were like pretty much familiar with. Uh, okay. Yeah, for me, I, I, uh, yeah. who, I never could, uh, her pronounce his name right, but like Karishma Sharma. Okay. Yeah. Let me right check on Google. Yeah. Okay. But I met Professor Yan Liu before mm -hmm. on KDD conference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm learning more and more on these topics because, like, my background is not actually CS. I mean, like, I I was trained in bachelor's for communication, so but yeah I'm yeah going through the gradually uh, learning many of the things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was a really helpful talk for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Feel free to connect me on uh, Boba, and then we can maybe have more conversations there. Great, thank you. Yeah, nice have to meet nice you. Yeah. <laughs> thank, you, thank you. Thank you so much.